Chapter 16, A Very Dirty Bird. Up he went, very quickly at first, then more slowly, then in a little while even more slowly than that, and finally, after many minutes of climbing up the endless stairway, one weary foot was barely able to follow the other. Milo suddenly realized that with all his effort, he was no closer to the top than when he began, and not a great deal further from the bottom. But he struggled on for a while longer, until, at last, completely exhausted, he collapsed onto one of the steps. I should have known, he mumbled, resting his tired legs and filling his lungs with air. This is just like the line that goes on forever, and I'll never get there. You wouldn't like it much anyway, someone replied gently. Infinity is a dreadful poor place. They can never manage to make ends meet. Milo looked up, with his head still resting heavily in his hand. He was becoming quite accustomed to being addressed at the oddest times, in the oddest places, by the oddest people, and this time he was not at all disappointed. Standing next to him on the step was exactly one half of a small child who had been divided neatly from top to bottom. Pardon me for staring, said Milo, after he had been staring for some time. But I've never seen half a child before. It's point five eight to be precise, replied the child from the left side of his mouth, which happened to be the only side of his mouth. I beg your pardon, said Milo. It's point five eight, he repeated. It's a little bit more than half. Have you always been that way? asked Milo impatiently, for he felt like that was a needlessly fine distinction. My goodness, no, the child assured him. A few years ago, I was just point four two, and believe me, that was a terrible inconvenience. What is the rest of your family like? said Milo, this time a bit more sympathetically. Oh, we're just the average family, he said thoughtfully. Mother, father, and 2.58 children. And, as I explained, I'm the point five eight. It must be rather odd being the only part of a person, Milo remarked. None at all, said the child. Every average family has 2.58 children, so I always have someone to play with. Besides, each family also has an average of 1.3 automobiles, and since I'm the only one who can drive three-tenths of a car, I get to use it all the time. But averages aren't real, objected Milo. They're just imaginary. That may be so, he agreed, but they're also very useful at times. For instance, if you didn't have any money at all, but you happened to be with four other people who had ten dollars apiece, then you'd each have an average of eight dollars. Isn't that right? I guess so, said Milo weakly. Well, think of how much better off you'd be just because of averages, he explained convincingly. And think of the poor farmer who it doesn't rain all year. If there wasn't an average yearly rainfall of... Thirty-seven inches in this part of the country, all his crops would wither and die. It all sounded terribly confusing to Milo, for he had always had trouble in school with just this subject. There are still other advantages, continued the child. For instance, if one rat were cornered by nine cats, then on average each cat would be ten percent rat, and the rat would be ninety percent cat. If you happen to be a rat, you can see how much easier it would make things. But that can never be, said Milo, jumping to his feet. Don't be too sure, said the child impatiently. For one of the nicest things about mathematics, or anything else you can might care to learn, is that many of the things which can never be, often are. You see, he went on. It's very much like you're trying to reach infinity. 
You know that it's there, but you just don't know where. But just because you can never reach it doesn't mean that it's not worth looking for. I hadn't thought of it that way, said Milo, starting down the stairs. I think I'll go back now. A wise decision, the child agreed. But try again some day. Perhaps you'll get much closer. And as Milo waved goodbye, he smiled warmly, which he usually did on the average of 47 times a day. Everyone here knows so much more than I do, thought Milo as he leaped from step to step. I'll have to do a lot better if I'm going to rescue the princesses. In a few moments, he'd reached the bottom again and burst into the workshop where Tok and the Humbug were eagerly watching the math and magician perform. Ha! Ah, back already! He cried, greeting him with a friendly wave. I hope you found what you were looking for! I'm afraid not, admitted Milo, and then he added in a very discouraged tone. Everything in Digitopolis is much too difficult for me. The mathematician nodded knowingly and stroked his chin several times. You'll find, he remarked gently, that the only thing you can do easily is be wrong, and that's hardly worth the effort. Milo tried very hard to understand all the things he'd been told and all the things he'd seen, and as he spoke, one curious thing still bothered him. Why is it, he said quietly, that quite often, even the things which are correct just don't seem to be right? A look of deep melancholy crossed the math magician's face, and his eyes grew moist with sadness. Everything was silent, and it was several minutes before he was able to reply at all. How very true, he sobbed, supporting himself on the staff. It has been that way since rhyme and reason were banished. Quite so, began the humbug. I personally feel that, and all because of that stubborn wretched Saz, roared the math magician, completely overwhelming the bug, for now his sadness had changed to fury, and he stalked about the room, adding up anger and multiplying wrath. It's all his fault! Perhaps if you discussed it with him, Milo started to say, but never had time to finish. He's much too unreasonable, interrupted the math magician again. Why, just last month, I sent him a very friendly letter which he never had the courtesy to answer. See for yourself. He handed Milo a copy of the letter which read, 7379401756789854147 But maybe he doesn't understand numbers, said Milo, who found it a little difficult to read himself. Nonsense! bellowed the math magician. Everyone understands numbers. No matter what language you speak, there's always mean the same thing. A seven is a seven anywhere in the world. My goodness, thought Milo. Everybody is so terribly sensitive about the things they know best. With your permission, said Tok, changing the subject, we'd like to rescue Rhyme and Reason. Has his ass agreed to it? The math magician inquired. Yes, sir, the dog assured him. Then I don't, he thundered again, for since they've been banished, we've never agreed on anything and we never will. He emphasized his last remark with a dark and ominous look. Never? asked Milo with the slightest touch of disbelief in his voice. Never! He repeated, and if you can prove otherwise, you have my permission to go. Well, said Milo, who had thought about this problem very carefully ever since leaving Dictionopolis. Then with whatever Azaz agrees, you disagree. Correct, 
said the mathematician with a tolerant smile. And with whatever Azaz disagrees, you agree. Also correct, yawned the math magician, nonchalantly clinging his fingernails with the point of his staff. Then, each of you agrees that he will disagree with whatever each of you agrees with, said Milo triumphantly. And if you both disagree with the same thing, then aren't you really in agreement? I've been tricked! cried the math magician helplessly, for no matter how he figured, it still came out just that way. Splendid effort, comment commented the humbug joyfully. Exactly the way I would have done it myself. And now may we go, added Top. The math magician accepted his defeat with grace, nodded weakly, and then drew three travelers to his side. It's a long and dangerous journey, he began softly, and a furrow of concern creased his forehead. Long before you find them, their demons will know you're there. Watch for them well, he emphasized, for when they appear, it might be too late. The humbug shuddered down to his shoes, and Milo felt the tips of his fingers suddenly grow cold. But there is one problem even more serious than that, he whispered ominously. What is it? gasped Milo, who was not sure he really wanted to know. I'm afraid I can tell you only when you return. Come along, said the mathematician, and I'll show you the way. And simply by carrying the three, he transported them all to the very edge of Digitopolis. Behind them lay all the kingdoms of wisdom, and up ahead a narrow, rutted path led toward the mountains in darkness. I'll never get the call up that, said Milo unhappily. True enough, replied the mathematician. But you can be in ignorance quick enough without riding all the way. And if you're to be successful, it will have to be step by step. But I would like to take my gifts, Milo insisted. Show you seal, announced the dodecahedron, who appeared from nowhere with his arms full. Here are your saints, and here are your sounds, and here, he said, handing Milo the last of them disdainfully, are your words. And most important of all, added the mathematician, here is your own magic staff. Use it well, and there is nothing it cannot do for you. He placed it in Milo's breast pocket, a small gleaming pencil, which, except for the size, was much like his own. Then, with a last word of encouragement, he and the dodecahedron, who was simultaneously sobbing, frowning, pining, and sighing from four of his saddest faces, made their farewells and watched as the three tiny figures disappeared into the forbidding mountains of ignorance. Almost immediately, the light began to fade as the difficult path wandered aimlessly upward inching forward almost as reluctantly as the trembling humbug. Tok, as usual, led the way, sniffing ahead for danger, and Milo, his bag of precious possessions slung over one shoulder, followed silently and resolutely behind. Perhaps someone should stay back to guard the way, said the unhappy bug, offering his services. But since his suggestion was met with silence, he followed glumly along. The higher they went, the darker it became, though it wasn't the darkness of night, but rather more like a mixture of lurking shadows and evil intentions which oozed from the slimy, moss-covered cliffs and blotted out the light. A cruel wind shrieked through the rocks, and the air was thick and heavy, as if it had been used several times before. On they went, Higher and higher up the dizzying trail, on one side the sheer stone walls and brutal peaks towering above them, and on the other an endless, limitless, bottomless nothing. I can hardly see a thing, said Milo, taking hold of Tok's tail as a sticky mist engulfed the moon. Perhaps we should wait till morning. There'll be morning enough for you soon came a reply from directly above, 
and this was followed by hideous cackling laugh. <laughs> Very much like someone choking on a fishbone. Clinging to one of the greasy rocks and blending almost perfectly with it was a large, unkempt, and exceedingly soiled bird who had looked more like a dirty floor mop than anything else. He had a sharp, dangerous beak, and the one eye he chose to open stared down maliciously. I don't think you understand, said Milo timidly as the watchdog growled a warning. We're looking for a place to spend the night. It's not yours to spend, the bird shrieked again and followed it with the same horrible laugh. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, you see, he started to explain. Dollars a cent, it's still not yours to spend, the bird replied haughtingly. But I didn't mean, insisted Milo. Of course you mean, interrupted the bird, closing the eye that had been opened and opening the one that had been closed. Anyone who'd spend a night that doesn't belong to him is very mean. Well, I thought that by, he tried again desperately. That's a different story, interjected the bird a bit more amiably. If you want to buy, I'm sure I can arrange to sell, but with what you're doing, you'll probably end up in a cell anyway. That doesn't seem right, said Milo helplessly. For what the bird was taking everything the wrong way, he hardly knew what he was saying. Agreed, said the bird with a sharp click of his beak. But neither is left, although if I were you, I would have left a long time ago. Let me try once more said Milo in an effort to explain. In other words, you mean you have other words? cried the bird happily. Well, by all means, use them. You're certainly not doing very well with the ones you have now. Must you always interrupt like this? said Tot irritably, for even he was becoming impatient. Naturally, the bird cackled. It's my job. I take the words right out of your mouth. Haven't we met before? I'm the ever-present word snatcher, and I'm sure I know your friend the bug. And then he leaned all the way forward and gave a terrible, knowing smile. The humbug, who was too big to hide and too frightened to move, denied everything. Is everyone who lives in ignorance like you? asked Milo. Much worse he said longingly, but I don't live here. I'm from a place far away called Context. Don't you think you should be getting back? Suggested the bug, holding one arm up in front of him. What a horrible thought, the bird shuddered. It's such an unpleasant place that I spend most all my time out of it. Besides, what could be nicer than these grimy mountains? <laughs> Almost anything, thought Milo as he pulled his collar up. And then he asked the bird, Are you a demon? I'm afraid not, he replied sadly, as several filthy tears rolled down his beak. I've tried, but the best I can imagine is to be a nuisance. And before Milo could reply, he flapped his dingy wings and flew off in a cascade of dust and dirt and fuzz. Wait, shouted Milo who thought of many more questions he wanted to ask. Thirty-four pounds, shrieked the bird as he disappeared into the fog. He was certainly no help, said Milo after they had been walking again for some time. That's why I drove him off, cried the humbug, fiercely brandishing his cane. Now let's find the demons. That might be sooner than you think remarked Tok, looking back at the suddenly trembling bug, and the trail turned again and continued to climb. In a few minutes, they'd reached the crest, only to find that beyond it lay another one even higher, and beyond that several more, whose tops were lost in the swirling darkness. For a short stretch, the path became broad and flat, and just ahead, leaning comfortably against a dead tree, stood a very elegant looking gentleman. He was beautifully dressed in a dark suit with a well-pressed shirt and tie. His shoes were polished, 
His nails were clean, his hat was well brushed, and a white handkerchief adorned his breast pocket. But his expression was somewhat blank. In fact, it was completely blank, for he had neither eyes, nose, nor mouth. Hello, little boy, he said amiably, shaking Milo by the hand. And how's the faithful dog? He inquired, giving Tuck three or four strong and friendly pats. And who is this handsome creature? He asked, tipping his hat to the very pleased humbug. I'm so happy to see you all. What a pleasant surprise to meet someone so nice, they all thought, and especially here. I wonder if you could spare me a little of your time, he inquired politely, and help with a few small jobs. Why, of course, said the tumbug cheerfully. Gladly, added Tok. Yes, indeed, said Milo, who wondered for just a moment how it was possible for someone so agreeable to have a face with no features at all. Splendid, he said happily, for there are just three tasks. Firstly, I would like to move this pile from here to there, he explained, pointing to an enormous mound of fine sand. But I'm afraid that all I have are these tiny tweezers. And he gave them to Milo, who immediately began transporting one grain at a time. Secondly, I would like to empty this well and fill the other, but I have no bucket, so you'll have to use this eyedropper. And he handed it to Tuck, who undertook once to carry a drop at a time from well to well. And lastly, I must have a hole through this cliff, and here is a needle to dig it. The eager humbug quickly set to work picking at the solid granite wall. When they had all been safely started, the very pleasant man returned to the tree and leaning against it once more, continued to stare vacantly down the trail, while Milo, Tuck, and the humbug worked hour after 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 hour. Chapter 17, Unwelcoming Committee The humbug whistled gaily at his work, for he was never as happy as when he had a job which required no thinking at all. After what seemed like days, he had dug a hole scarcely large enough for his thumb. Tuck shuffled steadily back and forth with a dropper in his teeth, but the full well was still almost as full as when he began and Milo's new pile of sand was hardly a pile at all. How very strange, said Milo, without stopping for a moment. I've been working steadily all this time, and I don't feel the slightest bit tired or hungry. I could go right on the same way forever. Perhaps you will, the man agreed with the yawn. At least it sounded like a yawn. Well, I wish I knew how long it was going to take, Milo whispered as the dog went by again. Why not use your magic staff and find out, replied Tok as clearly as anyone could with an eyedropper in his mouth. Milo took the shiny pencil from his pocket and quickly calculated that at the rate they were working, it would take each of them 837 years to finish. Pardon me, he said, tugging at the man's sleeve and holding the sheet of figures up for him to see. But it's going to take 837 years to do these jobs. Is that so? Replied the man without even turning around. Well, you'd better get on with it then. But it hardly seems worthwhile, said Milo softly. Worthwhile, 
the man roared indignantly. All I meant was that perhaps it isn't too important, Milo repeated, trying not to be impolite. <laughs> of course it's not important, he snarled angrily. I wouldn't have asked you to do it if I thought it was important. And now, as he turned to face them, he didn't seem quite so pleasant. Then why bother? asked Tot, whose alarm suddenly began to ring. Because, my young friends, he muttered sourly, what could be more important than doing unimportant things? If you stop to do enough of them, you'll never get to where you're going. <laughs> he punctuated his last remark with a villainous laugh. Then you must, gasped Tylo. Quite correct. Then he shrieked triumphantly. I am the terrible trivium, demon of petty tasks and worthless jobs, ogre of wasted effort and monster of habit. The humbug dropped his needle and stared in disbelief while Milo and Toc began to back away slowly. Don't try to leave, he ordered with a menacing sweep of his arm, for there's so much to do, and you still have over 800 years to go on the first job. But why do only unimportant things? asked Milo, who suddenly remembered how much time he spent every day doing them. Think of all the trouble it saves, the man explained, and his face looked as if he'd been grinning an evil grin, if he could grin at all. If you do, only the easy and useless jobs, you'll never have to worry about the important ones, which are so difficult. You just won't have the time, for there's always something to do to keep you from what you really should be doing. And if it weren't for that dreadful magic staff, you'd never know how much time you were wasting. As he spoke, he tiptoed slowly toward them with his arms outstretched and continued to whisper in a soft, deceitful voice. Now, do come and stay with me. We'll have so much fun together. There are things to fill and things to empty, things to take away and things to bring back, things to pick up and things to put down. And besides all that, we have pencils to sharpen holes to dig, nails to straighten, stamps to lick, and ever so much more. Why, if you stay here, you'll never have to think again, and with a little practice, you can become a monster of habit, too. They were all transfixed by the Trivium's soothing voice, but just as he was about to clutch them in his well-manicured fingers, a voice cried out, Run! Run! Milo, who thought it was Tot, turned suddenly and dashed up the hill. Run! Run! It shouted again, and this time Tot thought it was Milo and quickly followed him. Run! <laughs> Run! It urged once more, and now the humbug, not caring at all who said it, ran desperately after his two friends with the terrible trivium close behind him. This way, this way, the voice called again. They turned in its direction and scrambled up the difficult slippery rocks, sliding back at each step almost as far as they'd gone forward. With great effort and many helping paws from Tok, they reached the top of the ridge at last, but only two steps ahead of the furious trivium. Over here, over here, advised the voice, and without a moment's hesitation, they started through a puddle of sticky ooze, which quickly became ankle deep, then knee deep, then hip deep, until finally they were struggling along through what very much felt like a waist deep pool of peanut butter. The Trivium, who had discovered a mound of pebbles which needed counting, followed no more, but stood at the edge, shaking his fist, shouting horrible threats, and promising to rouse every demon in the mountains. What a nasty fellow, gasped Milo, who was having great difficulty just getting his legs to move. I hope I never meet him again. I believe he stopped chasing us, said the bug, looking back over his shoulder. It's not what's behind that worries me. 
remarked Ta as they stepped from the sticky mess. Who wants a head? Keep going street, keep going street, counseled the voice as they continued to pick their way carefully along the new path. Now step up, step up, they recommended. And almost before they knew what had happened, they had all taken a step up and then plunged to the bottom of a deep murky pit. But he said, up, Milo complained bitterly from where he lay sprawling. Well, I hope you didn't expect to get any rear by listening to me, said the voice gleefully. We'll never get out of here, the humbug moaned, looking at the steep, smooth sides of the pit. There is quite an accurate evaluation of the situation, said the voice coldly. Then why did you help us at all? shouted Milo angrily. No, oh, I'd do as much for anybody, he replied. Bad advice is my specialty. For as you can plainly see, I'm a long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bull-legged, big-footed monster, and if I do say so myself, one of the most frightening fiends in this whole wild wilderness. With me here, you wouldn't dare try to escape. And with that, he shuffled to the edge of the pit and leered down at his helpless prisoner. Talk and the humbug turned away in fright, but Milo, who had learned by now that people are not always what they say they are, reached for his telescope and took a long look for himself. And there at the rim of the hole, instead of what he expected, stood a small furry creature with very worried eyes and a rather sheepish grin. Why? You're not long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, or big-footed. And you're not at all frightening, said Milo indignantly. What kind of demon are you? The little demon, who seemed stunned at being found out, leapt back out of sight and began to whimper softly. Ain't the demon of insecurity, he sobbed. I don't mean what I say, I don't mean what I do, and I don't mean what I am. Most people who believe what I tell them to go the wrong way and stay there. But you and your awful telescope have spoiled everything. I'm going home. And crying hysterically, he stamped off in a huff. It certainly pays to have good look at things, observed Milo, as he wrapped up the telescope with great care. Now all we have to do is climb out, said Tuck, placing his front paws as high on the wall as he could. Here, hop on my back. Milo climbed onto the dog's shoulders. Then the bug crawled up both of them, and by standing on Milo's head, just managed to hook his cane on the roots of an old gnarled tree. With loud complaints, he hung on doggedly until the other two had climbed out over him and pulled him up, somewhat dazed and discouraged. I'll lead the way for now, he said, brushing himself off. Follow me and we'll stay out of trouble. He guided them along one of five narrow ledges, all of which led to a grooved and rutted plateau. They stopped for a moment to rest and make plans, but Before they had done either, the whole mountain trembled violently, and with a sudden lurch, rose high into the air, carrying them along with it, for quite accidentally they had stepped into the calloused hand of the gelatinous giant. And what have we here? He roared, looking curiously at the tiny figures huddled in his palm and licking his lips. He was an incredible size, even sitting down, with long, unkempt hair, bulging eyes, and a shape hardly worth speaking of. He looked, in fact, very much like a colossal bowl of jelly, without the bowl. How dare you disturb my nap, he bellowed furiously, and the force of his hot breath tumbled them over in his hand. We're terribly sorry said Milo meekly when he'd untangled himself. But you looked just like part of the mountain. Naturally, the giant replied in a more normal voice 
but even this was like an explosion. I have no shape of my own, so I try to be just like whatever I'm near. In the mountains, I'm a lofty peak. On the beach, a broad sandbar. In the forest, a towering oak. And sometimes in the city, I'm a very handsome twelve-story apartment house. I just hate to be conspicuous. It's really not safe, you know. Then he looked at them again with hungry eyes and wondered how well they'd taste. You look much too big to be afraid of anything, said Milo quickly, for the giant had already begun to open his mouth wide. I'm not he said with a slight shiver that ran over his gelatinous body. I'm afraid of everything. That's why I'm so ferocious. If others found out, I'd just die. Now do be quiet while I eat my breakfast. He raised his hand toward his gaping mouth, and the humbug shut his eyes tightly and clasped both hands over his head. Then aren't you really a fearful demon? Milo asked desperately on the assumption that the giant had been brought up well enough not to talk with a mouthful. Well, approximately, yes, he replied, lowering his arm to the vast relief of the bug. That is, comparatively so. What I mean is, relatively, maybe. In other words, roughly, perhaps. What does everyone else think? There, you see? he said peevishly. I'm even afraid to make a positive statement. So please stop asking questions before I lose my appetite altogether. Then he raised his arm once again and prepared to swallow the three of them in one gulp. Why don't you help us rescue Rhyme and Reason? Then maybe things will get better, shouted Milo again, this time almost too late, for in another instant they would have all been gone. Oh, I wouldn't do that, said the giant thoughtfully, lowering his arm once more. I mean, why not leave well enough alone? That is, it'll never work. I wouldn't take a chance. In other words, let's keep things as they are. Changes are so frightening. And as he spoke, he began to look a bit ill. Maybe I'll just eat one of you, he remarked unhappily, and save the rest for later. I don't feel well. I have a better idea, said Milo. You do, interrupted the giant, losing any desire to eat at all. If it's one thing I can't swallow with ideas, they're so hard to digest. I have a box full of all the ideas in the world, said Milo, proudly holding up the gift King Azad had given him. The thought of it terrified the giant, who began to shake like an enormous pudding. Put me down and just go away, he pleaded, forgetting for a moment who had hold of whom. And please don't open that box. In another moment, he'd set them down on the next jagged peak, and with panic in his eyes, lumbered off to warn the others of this terrible new threat. But news travels quickly. The word snatcher, the trivium, and the long-nosed, green-eyed, curly-haired, wide-mouthed, thick-necked, broad-shouldered, round-bodied, short-armed, bow-legged, big-footed monster had already spread the alarm throughout the evil, unenlightened mountains. And out the demons came, from every cave and every crevice, through every fissure and crack, from under the rocks and up from the mud, stomping and shuffling, slithering and sliding through the murky shadows. And all had only one thought in mind. Destroy the intruders and protect ignorance. From where they stood, Milo, Tuck, and the humbug could see them moving steadily forward, still far away, but coming quickly. On all sides, the cliffs were alive with this evil collection of crawling, looming, creeping, lurching shapes. Some could be seen plainly, others were but dim silhouettes, and yet still more only now beginning to stir from their foul places, would be along much sooner than they were wanted. We'd better hurry, barked Tot, or they are sure to catch us. And he started up the trail again. Milo took one deep breath and did the same, 
and the bug, now that he knew what lay behind, ran ahead with renewed enthusiasm.